Well, this morning, I want to I talk to you, speak to you about the phrase, the dark night of the soul. Would you say that with me? The dark night of the soul. The phrase comes from, it's a 16th century phrase, comes from St. John of the Cross. And I got looking into that, and it became very um, academic. It took me kind of out down a, a path that I really wasn't envisioning for this particular service. I would encourage those of you who are, um, would like to look further into this term, it began as a poem, um, to look up St. John of the Cross, and you can do some of your own study uh, at that time. But this phenomenon describes the experience that even the strongest of Christians will often feel. Sometimes they suffer through the dark night of the soul. Even Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and he suffered terribly, yet he finished the work that God had for him. It was this kind of dreadful experience that caused King David, the king of Israel, the leader of Israel, to soak his pillow with tears night after night after night. It was this kind of sorrow that earned the prophet Jeremiah the title, the weeping prophet. This is no ordinary experience of depression. It is an, a, a depression that is linked to a crisis of faith. A crisis that comes when you and I sense that God is not there. We cry and we pray and we don't see responses to what we ask for. It is the, abs the feeling of the absence of God or even the abandonment by God. Listen to the words of King David, a man after God's own heart, the apple of God's eye. In Psalm chapter 22, verses 1 to 2, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Anybody ever feel like that? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, and I find no rest. In Psalm 13, he says this. Maybe you've said this. How long, O oh Lord? How long? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow that, in, that is in my heart all day long? How long, Lord? This darkness is real. It can be surprising to some that people of faith can suffer such deep, paralyzing uh, darkness in their life when they have faith. But I believe that nearly every Christian at some point will experience this dark night of the soul, or you already have experienced it. Our Christian faith, if you've been serving God long at all, you know our Christian faith vacillates. We move from faith to faith, and in between, we have periods of doubt, like the man in Matthew chapter 9 who said, Lord, I believe, but, any Bible readers out here? Help me in my unbelief. The Apostle Paul, writing to a group of Christians in Corinth, shares his experience. He says, we are hard-pressed on every side, we're, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but not destroyed. This passage indicates that there are limits to the dark night that we experience. The darkness may be profound, but it's not permanent. Somebody needs to hear that today. It will end. Notice the Apostle Paul describes our condition. He says, we're hard-pressed, crushed, and perplexed. Say those three things. We're hard-pressed, crushed, and perplexed. These are powerful images that describe the conflict that happens in the life and the heart of the believer. But he also describes the limits of this trial. We're hard-pressed, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're abandoned. We're, we're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We're struck down, but we are not destroyed. 
So these dark seasons are real and they're devastating, but they will not crush us. In writing to the Christians in Philippi, Paul tells us not to be anxious about anything. He goes on to say that our anxiety, the answer to our anxiety is to be on our knees. And if we'll stay on our knees long enough, the peace that surpasses understanding will come. Again, we can be anxious, we can be nervous, we can be worried without submitting to ultimate despair. The choir just sang a beautiful version of Psalm 23. Wasn't that powerful? It's beautiful. In Psalm 23, the psalmist says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. If you have never faced the night of the soul, well, let me ask you this. Let's just do it this way. Based on my description just now, how many of you would say that you have at some point in your life, maybe right now, you face the dark night of the soul? Just raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, most of you. And if you haven't, no one likes to hear this, you will. For 50% of Americans, the day after the presidential election, not meaning to be funny, 50% of Americans will say, why, Lord? How could you let this happen? Our country's going, going, you know, to, well, you know. The dark night of the soul can last for days, or I've had friends and it has lasted for over two years. I'm not suggesting this morning that it can be overcome with one prayer, although I can personally testify that it has happened in my life, just one prayer. But I've also had these these dark nights when it lasted for months and I cried and I cried and could not see light at the end of the tunnel. But I will say this, every single time, God brought me out. Might have taken longer than I wished, but he always brought me out. And he brought me out, the answer, I believe, is is through five words. If you want to get out of the dark night of the soul, Fix your eyes on Jesus. Every time in my life when I took my eyes off Jesus, that's when I lost my way. When I put them on people or on a pastor or on my circumstance, I lost my way. The Bible says that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. So we need to keep our eyes on him. He's faithful. He is always with us. He is the good shepherd who in time will guide us to green pastures and still waters. Aren't you thankful for that? God himself says, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fires, The fires will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Fix your eyes on Jesus. That word fix means to glue them. Don't take your eyes off. Fix them on him, and he will see you through. So if you're facing this faith crisis or a dark night of the soul, in just a few moments, I want to invite you to come up for prayer to receive help, to receive God's presence and power in your life. We are going to spend the rest of this service praying, specifically praying for healing. Now, when I say healing, I'm not talking just physical healing, although that is part of it. You may have relationship that's broken, a financial ruin, an addiction, um, a habitual sin, Maybe something physical. Maybe it's cancer. Maybe you don't know. Maybe there's some tests that are still out there. But I invite you to come in just a few moments and pray. 
The 14th article of faith in the Church of the Nazarene speaks to our belief in divine healing. We recognize God uses surgeries and medicines and all of that. We, we, we don't take away from that. We believe God is even in some of that. But we recognize that God is the ultimate physician. And we believe that because God is all-powerful and he is sovereign. And he is able to heal diseases, restore relationships, forgive sin, give strength to the weary, comfort to the hurting, and freedom for the addicted. So this morning, we have pastors at eight different stations. There'll be one on each side of the balcony, and the rest will be six of them will be down here on the floor. They will pray for you according to James chapter five. That reads like this. If anyone is sick, you should call the elders of the church to pray for you and anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus. It goes on to say that if you've sinned, you'll be forgiven. So if there's sin in your life, it would be a time in which you would come and, 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 and confess sin as well. Let me just show you how that would work. So we have oil, and uh, here's a sample of oil. There's nothing magical about the oil. It's, it's uh, olive oil, but it's symbolic. It's, it's, a, it's a point of contact, symbolizing the Holy Spirit in our life. So you would come forward. We're not going to kneel. You just stand in front of a pastor, and they will anoint you either on your head or on your hand. But you would give your name, first of all, and then just very, very briefly tell them what you're praying for. You might come up and just say, I'm, I'm, I'm praying for a relationship. Or you might be specific and say, my marriage is broken. You might say, I'm praying for an addiction. Or you may be specific and say, I can't get away from pornography. Um, you can be as specific as you want. They'll keep it confidential between you and them. Maybe some of you, and I'll talk to this in a minute, but want to pray for someone else. You want to come up and be anointed on behalf of someone who couldn't be here today. So we're going to pray. We're going to pray to Jesus to bring healing physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, financially, and mentally. When I was a kid, we used to sing the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And one of the lines says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And so don't leave here needlessly when the answer could be right up here during this time of prayer. So we're going to take it to God. I don't know why God heals some and he doesn't seem to heal others. Obviously, he does heal everyone. When we get to heaven, that's our ultimate healing. Amen? But wouldn't you like some relief here on earth? Amen? But it doesn't stop me. Even though I don't know why he heals some and doesn't others, it doesn't stop me from tugging at his beard or swinging for the fence and asking him to do something on your behalf and on my behalf. Reverend Dwayne Miller was a pastor, and um, he, he caught a, a rare flu, and the flu caused him to lose his voice, where it was very raspy. He had to quit his job as a senior pastor. He attended a local church. He went for two years to doctors and specialists trying to fix his, his throat, and they couldn't fix it. Couldn't do anything to cause him to speak regularly again. And so he was attending a church, and a pastor said, hey, I recognize you have gifts and abilities and talent, and uh, you're a man of the word, and so would you be willing to teach a class for us? And so he said, sure. So he taught a class on a scripture that they had assigned to him to teach. And in the middle of this teaching, you're going to hear it in just a moment. After two years, God began to heal him, and you'll hear the difference in his voice Listen to this. So when the psalmist writes, and he heals all of my diseases, let me say to you that I believe God still heals. That hasn't ended. That is not over. Now you have to be careful on how you do this. Because there are folks who carry things to an excess, and it becomes a show. And God has never intended that that be what it is. God heals in his sovereign will. I don't know why God does things that he does, but I know that he does. And the only thing he requires of me is to allow him to be God and me to be me and let it be. 
to say that every single person will always be healed because Jesus died on the cross is a misinterpretation of scripture. Not true. Won't work. Isaiah 53 doesn't talk about physical healing. I'm sorry. That's just not the context. And to impress that there causes a misinterpretation of scripture. That's wrong. On the other hand, to say that, since we don't have anything after the book of Acts, that miracles ended at the book of Acts and they never happen again, is equally as wrong. Because you have put God in a box both ways. And he doesn't want to be in the box. So, the psalmist says, I'm excited, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. One of his benefits is, he heals all of my diseases. And in verse 4 he says, and he redeems my life from the pit. Now, I like that verse just a whole lot. I have had, and you have had in times past, pit experiences. We've both had, we've all had times when our life seemed to be in a pit, in a grave. And we didn't have an answer for the pit we find ourselves in. And I don't understand this right now. I'm been overwhelmed at the moment. I'm not quite sure what to say or do. <laughs> I'm uh, Sounds funny to say at a loss for words. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Praise God. He redeems my life from the pit of hell. If you're watching online this morning, we're going to uh, divert your attention to a, another pastor who is going to pray for you, specifically if you're watching online. For the rest of you here today, we're going to move into a time of prayer. Thanks, Pastor Daryl, and thank you for joining with us at SNC today. You heard a message about healing, and we know that there's so many people out there. Maybe that's you today. You've been watching uh, from your couch or maybe from a hospital room. Maybe you're in your car, and you are sensing that you need some healing in your life. In James chapter 5, verse 15, it talks about how a prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. And so right now, I just want to pray for you, whether that's an emotional healing, whether that's a physical healing, whatever type of healing you need in your life, let us pray now. Father, we thank you uh, for those who are joining with us, who are coming to you in faith. Lord, we need a healing from you. And so I pray that right now, whether that's physical, emotional, maybe that's a spiritual healing, that God, that you will be present in their life just as you have been present with us here today. And so we just ask God that you bring your mighty touch in their life, that you will heal them, that you will raise them up and make them well. We thank you, Jesus, and we ask this in your name, amen. Well, if you prayed with us here today for that healing, would you connect with us? Would you let us know uh, that you prayed uh, with us? And you can go to sncLife.family and let us know. Well, thanks for joining with us today. We hope you're back and we hope to see you soon.